the subject that I want to address today is the subject of hell. That's what we're going to be considering. And, and we're going to look at this in the light of our preparation for Jesus' coming. Because it is a duty, God-given duty, upon me to share things that will help you be prepared for Jesus to come. So when we talk about hell, the idea that has been sketched in many people's minds is of um, eternal burning fire that is um, burning away, has been and continues to burn and will always burn, where disobedient people are placed as and, and kept in a state of torment, torture, suffering for all of eternity they never actually die they are always alive with conscious pain and they can think and their memory is with them and and that painting has been described and the and the 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 situation for the saints is quite the opposite it's a place of of a beautiful heaven you know you're you're in a cloud you're enjoying life and you're just you're just um floating in joys of ecstasy. That, they are the pictures that have been drawn over the centuries. But if I was to ask you a question, who is it, righteous or wicked, which one of those two will be living in eternal fire? Is it the righteous or the wicked? Let us turn our Bibles to... Isaiah chapter 33. Isaiah chapter 33. Who will live in everlasting fire? Isaiah chapter 33. And we want to take, we want to allow the Bible to paint the picture, not the traditions of churches and, and preachers who have taken the scriptures into their own imagination and twisted them. But let us just read it plainly and we'll see in Isaiah 33 Isaiah 33 and starting in verse 14 the zin the sinners in Zion are afraid fearfulness hath surprised the hypocrites who among us shall dwell with the devouring fire and who among us shall dwell with everlasting burnings there's the question who is it Righteous or wicked? The, the view today that's held by thousands of people is that it's the wicked who will live in a turning, uh, eternally burning fire. But notice what verse 15 says, who will, be bur who will dwell with everlasting burnings? He that walketh righteously and speaketh uprightly, he that despise, despises the gain of oppressions, and shaketh his hands from holding of bribes, and stoppeth his ears from hearing of blood, and shutteth his eyes from seeing evil. They are the ones who will live in everlasting burnings, according to Scripture. The text that often paints the picture the other way and we will read it in Revelation chapter 14. Revelation chapter 14, that, um, that often governs the, the teachings of men today in their um, twisted appreciation of this scripture, is in Revelation 14 and verse, uh, in verse 10. Speaking of the wicked... The same shall drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out without mixture into the cup of his indignation. And he shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. And the smoke of their torment ascendeth up forever and ever, and they have no rest day or night who worship the beast and his image and whosoever receiveth the mark of his name. So what we want to do, we want to investigate a little, what is the truth about hell? 
And the, the scriptures in Jude chapter 1 and verse 7 give us an example of what to look for in relation to this eternal fire. And that is Jude 1 and verse 7. In fact, Jude doesn't have any chapters, so it's just verse 7. Jude verse 7. And here it says, Even as Sodom and Gomorrah and the cities about them in like manner, giving themselves over to fornication and going after strange flesh, are set forth for an example, suffering the vengeance of eternal fire. Now we have to understand something that the word eternal fire means exactly that. It's eternal fire. Some people have thought, well, it's just eternal results of the fire. No, no, it's eternal fire. It doesn't stop. But they suffered the vengeance of eternal fire. There is an example and we want to look at this and, and if you want to jot down, you're taking notes, jot down Genesis chapter 19 and verse 24. And in Genesis 19 verse 24, we see that Jehovah was on earth. And in verse 24, we see that Jehovah rained fire out of Jehovah in heaven. So firstly, we have two Jehovahs, because wherever you read the capital L-O-R-D, that's the word Jehovah. So the Lord rained fire and brimstone out of from the Lord in heaven upon Sodom and Gomorrah. So where was the source of the fire? Can someone tell me? It was God, out from God from heaven. And so the Bible tells us, if you look at Sodom and Gomorrah, here's an example of them suffering the vengeance of eternal fire. Now, another example is found in Leviticus chapter 10 and verse 1. And you can skip your Bibles through to, to Leviticus chapter 10 and verse 1. And it says, talking of Nadab and Abihu. And Nadab and Abihu, the sons of Aaron, took either of them his censer and put fire therein and put incense thereon and offered strange fire before the Lord, which he commanded them not. And what happened? So here's some disobedience. People who, who made a profession of following the Lord and he was disobedient. And verse 2, and there went out fire, where from? From the Lord and devoured them and they died before the Lord. So here is another example in the Old Testament of this fire coming out from God and devouring these two ministers. So again, we see where the source of this eternal fire is coming from. And you probably recall the story of, of Elijah. Elijah, and you can read that in 1 Kings chapter 18. First, if you're taking notes, 1 Kings chapter 18 and, and especially verse 38. Because the question was, who is the God that will answer by fire? And so they, the Baal worshippers um, set their altar up and no fire came. But the God that would answer by fire, he was the true God. And so when Elijah put, made his altar and put the wood and the, uh, on, on the rocks and the, the offering on and poured water all over it, so you know, you couldn't, no one could light a match and say, oh, yeah, he uh, just tricked us by starting some little flame there to get it going. So they doused it with water. It was all soaking wet. And then he hopped on his knees and he prayed and the fire came from the Lord and devoured the offering, the wood, the rocks and the dust. Everything was consumed. It was gone. And so we see here from these three examples that this fire can consume straight out ungodly, wicked sinners like Sodom and Gomorrah. It will also consume hypocrites that have a pretense of religion like Nadab and Abihu. And it also will consume the elements of dust and rocks. 
And so the elements will melt with fervent heat. And all these are examples of this eternal fire. And so let's look at the judgment where we get the uh, where people um, have, have perverted the uh, modern, modern view of hell. Let's turn there and read it in Revelation. Revelation chapter 20. Revelation 20 and verse 9. And here Satan had gathered all the hosts and to, to take over the city in verse 9. And they went up on the breadth of, a breadth of the earth and compassed the city, the, the camp of the saints about and the beloved city. And fire came down from God out of heaven and devoured them. And then the, the illustration of the lake of fire, this the fire consuming not just the wicked but the elements as peter says the elements will melt with fervent heat and so you essentially have this lake of fire and and this is where um this fire that has proceeded from god has consumed the false prophet and and so on and so this fire is coming out from god let's read another text in Hebrews, Hebrews chapter 12 and verse 29. Hebrews chapter 12 and verse 29 tells us, For our God is a consuming fire. Our God is a consuming fire. Is God eternal? Has His fire always been burning? Has it ever stopped? Will it ever stop? No. So we're not just looking at the consequence of this fire, but the fire itself is eternal. God, our God, is a consuming fire. Now this fire is not just a, a, a typical wood, wood fire where you stoke it up every day and make sure it doesn't go out. Jesus said in, in Mark chapter 9 that it's unquenchable fire. You can't put it out. And so we want to just look at what the Bible has to say in describing this fire so we can appreciate some of the language that we often trip over when it seems like, well, when Jesus said that their worm shall not die and the fire shall not be quenched. And what does he mean by that? So if, if you're taking notes, what we're going to do now, we're going to just go through a few Bible texts that reveal to us what sort of characteristics this fire has. Because when you say fire, we often think you light a match, you've got fire. But let us allow the Bible to describe a fire for us that we could probably relate to today with our technology. Let's... Look at it in Daniel chapter 7 and verse 10. We, we're looking at the fire. God, our God is eternal fire and we want to consider this from the Bible. In, in Daniel chapter 7 and I'll, actually I'll start in verse 9. Daniel chapter 7 verse 9. I beheld till the thrones were cast down and the ancient of days did sit whose garment was white as snow and the hair of his head like pure wool. His throne was like the fiery flame and his wheels as burning fire. Verse 10. A fiery stream issued and came forth from before him. So here is a stream. You know, it's it, this is a radiating stream of fire. It just goes and goes and goes. Unlike wood fire, where it sort of, you know, laps up and jumps up and down. This is a fiery stream that come that comes from before him. And. Are there people there? Are there beings there? Yes, thousands, thousands ministered unto him. And 10,000 times 10,000 stood before him. The judgment was set and the books were open. Now, what, why are these beings not killed? Can they live in eternal burning 
fire? The angels. What is one of the names of the angels? One of the names is called seraphim. Do you know what seraphim means? Burning ones. That's what the word means. The angels are burning. But are they suffering? No. And so here we have a principle of the fire. Firstly, it's a stream. According to scripture, this fire radiates and doesn't stop. Secondly, Zechariah 14 and verse 12. Zechariah 14 and verse 12. And if I'm reading a little bit too fast, just jot them down and be a Berean. Go home and make sure these things are so. So Zechariah 14 and verse 12. We're looking at the description from the Bible, what this fire is like. Zechariah 14 verse 12. And this shall be the plague wherewith the Lord shall smite all the people that have fought against Jerusalem. Their flesh shall consume away while they stand upon their feet, and their eyes shall consume away in their holes, and their tongues, their, and their tongues sorry, shall consume away in their mouth. Wow. So this fire, according to inspiration, devours soft tissue first. They're standing on their feet, and what happens? Their tongues and their eyes go. So this radiating fire devours soft tissue first. Now let's look at another one in Ezekiel 28 verse 18, speaking of the same last day fire that, that is going to be um, revealed to all people. We see in Ezekiel 28 and verse 18, speaking of Lucifer. Thou hast defiled thy sanctuaries. Ezekiel 28 verse 18. Thou hast defiled thy sanctuaries by the multitude of thine iniquities, by the iniquity of thy traffic. Therefore will I bring forth a fire from the midst of thee. And it shall devour thee, and I will bring thee to ashes upon the earth in the sight of all them that behold thee. Okay, this is speaking of Lucifer, but if you read in, in the book of Obadiah and you go through it, so will all the wicked have a fire from the midst of them. If you look at there, I forget the exact verse in Obadiah. There's only one chapter, so you can't get too lost in the book. Um, I think it's actually... Verse 18, Obadiah 18, but you can look that up. So this fire, we're looking at the description of this fire. Our God is a consuming fire. He's always burning. It's eternal burning. The question is, who's going to dwell with God? The wicked or righteous? Who's going to live in this? It's the righteous, we read in Isaiah chapter 33. But, and, and as we see this fire, we see that it comes out as a stream. It continues to radiate like a stream. It devours soft tissue first and it starts inside and works out. So you think about that. You know, do we know of fire that can burn the inside without burning the outside? I mean, just think of your microwave. When, it, when your microwave heats up your food, does it do it out to in or in to out? Inside out. So it can go past, it can devour soft tissue, start from inside and burn out. So it's not a wood fire. And this is when Jesus says, you know, the fire can't be quenched. You can't just put it out. You can't get a fire extinguisher and just, shh, now the fire's gone. And you probably know when you stand in the sun, when the sun rays, the, the, the radiation from the sun, when it hits you, doesn't it warm inside you? You know, you can stand by a, a heater and, and it warms you. Your, your hands are burning outside, but you're still cold. The, the, the core of you is still cold. But then when you stand in the sun, it just, it just really warms inside of us. And so we can see that this fire can't be quenched. You can't just pour water and stop the the radiation from the sun and you just can't do it and so 
this fire starting from within, Mark chapter 9 and verse 44, Jesus is speaking of this fire. And he says that their worm shall not die. Now, when, when, we, uh, when, wood fire, when we put on a wood fire to burn, maybe we're a martyr at the stake and, and we're there tied up and the fire goes, would you die before your body is consumed? Okay, but if you are burning from a, a, a radioactive source, you can live for an awful long time before you're actually consumed. You can be burning for an awful long time. And different parts of your body go at different times. And you're conscious the whole time. So here Christ is revealing the last day judgment fire. You can't quench it. You can't put it out. It's something that doesn't just knock the person out by, by just sheer pain of, of the bodily, but an internal um, burning. It's a stream. It burns soft tissue first. Can we, can we get a bit of a picture of what the Bible is trying to communicate to us that our God is? And so when this fire uh, devours, is it true that the wicked will never cease in existence. Let's read the Bible, plain statement from the Bible, because if, if there is torment day and night without rest, we can think, well, maybe, maybe they, they actually don't die. But that theory flies in the face of so many other clear biblical statements. So proper Bible, Bible students will take not just one statement, but weight, weight of evidence. Is the wages of sin death? Okay. Does the Bible say that in death there's no more thought and memory? The Bible says that. So let's look at Obadiah. And starting in verse 15, and we'll get the, the context of this, because this is talking about the last days. Obadiah chapter 1 and verse 15. And it says, For the day of the Lord is near upon all the heathen, as thou, as thou hast done, it shall be done unto thee. Thy reward shall return upon thine own head. For as ye have drunk upon my holy mountain, so shall all the heathen drink continually. Yea, they shall drink, they shall swallow down, and they shall be as though they had not been. This drinking of a cup, is that equated with the last day punishment? We read that in, in Revelation 14, where it says that they should drink of the wine of God's wrath that's poured out without mixture. It's, it is unprotected um, exposure to God himself in the presence of the Lamb and the angels. You know, sometimes we get people painting the picture that God just sits there looking at all these burning, suffering beings and, and just says, Ah, see you guys, you should have listened to me now, you're burning in that fire over there. The fact, our God is a consuming fire and they're consumed in His presence. Why? Because He is the fire. That's why they're consumed in His presence. And indeed, there is no rest because the rest comes from receiving Jesus Christ. That you could live in the fire and yet have no pain. You'll be at rest. They have no rest. The angels of God have rest. All God's saints have rest. But the wicked have no rest. And the fire doesn't go out at night. So it's not that God shuts down and winds down at night and the fire's out so that there's no torment during the night. Day and night, my friends, the fire is burning. Our God lives eternally and so we continue as they they shall be as though they had not been they won't exist that is what the scripture is saying to us but upon mount zion shall be deliverance and there shall be holiness and the house of jacob shall possess their possessions and the house of jacob shall be a fire and the house of joseph a flame and the house of Esau for stubble, and they shall kindle in them and devour them, and they shall not 
they shall not be any remaining of the house of Esau, for the Lord hath spoken it. So, this fire, this devouring fire, what is it actually going to be burning? Let us read in Romans chapter 8, and we want to make this very clear. Romans chapter 8. Sorry, did I say chapter 8? I meant to say Romans chapter 1, verse 18. Romans chapter 1 and verse 18. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who hold the truth in unrighteousness. What is the wrath of God? This fire against men? Is that what it's against? Is God against human beings? No, he is against ungodliness and unrighteousness of men. That's what he's against. God is against sin. And those who hold the truth in unrighteousness. How can we ever hold the truth in unrighteousness? Do you know how we can do that? We can have all the knowledge of the truth. We can be extremely religious and never put it into practice. So we could be holding the truth in our brains as understanding what absolute truth is. Yet it's housed in a brain that does not obey God. Therefore, it is unrighteous. And so the fire is not just against people's action of sin, but it is the harboring of sin in the heart. God is against that. Is that pretty clear from the scripture? The wrath of God is revealed against sin. Now we read in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 and verse 8, 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 and verse 8, we read, talking of the wicked, and we're going to read through to verse 12. And when and then shall the wicked be revealed, whom the Lord shall consume with what? The spirit of his mouth. So what is equated with this fire? The spirit. And shall destroy with the brightness of his coming. Even him whose coming is after the working of Satan with all power and signs and lying wonders and with all the deceivableness of unrighteousness in them that perish because they received not the love of the truth that they might be saved. For this cause shall God send them strong delusions, that they should believe a lie, that they might be damned who believed not the truth, but had pleasure in unrighteousness. So as we hold sin, we actually like sin. Do you like sin? Is there certain sins that you like? Then be it known that the wrath of God, that flame is to consume that. Let us go back to chapter 1, 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, and verse 8. When Jesus comes, what will happen? When he comes in the clouds. It's not just about going to a certain place that we call hell. This is about the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. In verse 8, it says, In flaming fire, taking vengeance on, on them that know not God. Do you know God? Ponder this. If we do not know God, we will be consumed by Him. You remember Jesus' parable where believers were doing all these wonderful things in His name. You ate and, and, and spoke with us in the streets. You've eaten and, and drunk with us in our house. God says, well, I don't know you. Those people will be consumed at the brightness of His coming. And them that know not God, and that obey not the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, who shall be punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of His power. 
Tell me, when Jesus comes, will he come in great glory and power? That's what the scripture says. Now, have you got the wherewithal to withstand such a revelation? Can anyone see God and live? No. He's got a respecter of persons. Does he say, well, I'll, I'll, you won't die, but you, I will. No, God is not a respecter of persons. He, he loves everyone exactly the same. So why do some die and some don't? Well, some respond to the gospel and some don't. So then, what is the gospel? What is the gospel? Romans chapter 6 and verse 6. Now this understanding that our God is a consuming fire, and when He appears, what do you suppose you'll do? What do you suppose you'll do? Romans chapter 6, notice what the gospel is all about. Romans 6 verse 6, Knowing this, that our old man is crucified with him, that the body of sin might be destroyed. What is the gospel about? Christ wants to destroy sin. But you know, he actually really doesn't want to destroy you. And so God knew full well that with his glory, if he was to... Um, reveal his glory to sinful man, they would cease to exist, full stop, because he is a consuming fire. So he thinks, well, what am I going to do? I love these people. If I show myself to them, they're going to die. Now, the Bible says that our sins have separated us from God. And we think, oh, so God hates sinners. Now, do you know why God had to withdraw himself from us as sinners? So he didn't kill us. Isn't that nice? He knew full well that his, his glory, his power, his fire that he is, the angels can live in it. They're not sinners. But we? We can. And when, when Lucifer and the angels fell, they were cast out of heaven because God is... Is, is, is just hates people or he just wants to give them a chance to show their colors of really who they are and so god has to withdraw for the sake of the person's life otherwise he'd, they'll die but yet god knows that if they get to know him they would want him but for god to reveal himself to them they would die so what is he going to do well, he's going to veil his glory in human flesh so that we can behold the glory of the only begotten of the Father, full of glory and truth. And so when Christ died, the sole reason was to get rid of sin, but not get rid of you as a person. So the body of sin might be destroyed and henceforth we should not serve sin. For he that is dead is freed from sin. Now if we be dead with Christ, we believe that we shall also live with him. Knowing that Christ being raised from the dead dieth no more, death has no more dominion over him. The only reason why death can actually take place is because of sin. And if Christ can remove our sin, then could we die in his presence? You never could. You never could die in the God's presence if you didn't have sin. And so he wants us to live with him. But if he wants us to live with him with unveiled glory, then firstly he must take away our sins. And so we need to understand firstly that if we want to be ready for Jesus to come, this is the bottom line of it, separate yourself from sin. Separate from sin. Now when Jesus came to earth, he received the name of Jesus. Why? Matthew chapter 1, Matthew chapter 1 and verse 27. 
It said, sorry, 21. Matthew 1, verse 21. And she shall bring forth a son, and thou shalt call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sins. That's his mission, to save you from your sins. Now, the devil has really made heyday with Christianity because he's put in a teaching that you can be saved in your sin. That you'll be, going, you'll be a sinner right up until the day Jesus comes. But if you're a sinner until the day Jesus comes, what's going to happen when you sin? You're going to die. And so the idea that is taught that we'll be changed, our, our sins will be removed in a twinkling of an eye when Jesus comes, is the, is the most deceptive lie you could ever have. Because then it's too late. And Satan laughs and rubs his hands when he can get people to preach that you'll be changed in the twinkling of an eye regarding your character and sin. Your bodies, yes. But you as a person... You have to give up your sin. If you don't give, that, give it up now, why would you give it up then? Will God manipulate you to become someone you're not and, and, and mess with your head so that then all of a sudden, yeah, I'll just be happy in heaven. You know, if, you don't, if, if we don't give up our sin now, we won't be happy in heaven. In fact, heaven will be a torment day and night without rest. And in fact, that's exactly what the punishment is. Being in the presence of God with no, with no veil, unveiled glory. Sinners and saints alike will see God in their fire. And this is what Jesus taught in Matthew chapter 9, sorry, Mark chapter 9, when he was telling about this fire. He says, you know, cut off your hand. If your hand is offended, you cut it off. For it's better for you to go into heaven lame than to burn. Because if there is any sin that is being harbored and cherished by you, you won't make it. Mark 9. And I will just read um, in verse 27. And if thy eye offend thee, pluck it out. For it is better for thee to enter into the kingdom of heaven with one eye than having two eyes and be cast into hell, into hell fire. Therefore, where their worm dieth not, and the fire is not quenched. Then it says in verse 49, For everyone shall be salted with fire. How many people? Everyone. Righteous and unrighteous alike shall be, shall be um, exposed to God's glory. So what do we need to prepare? Yes, we need to separate ourselves from sin. Let's turn back to Romans chapter 6 and allow the Bible to communicate the gospel to us that Christ died for the sole reason of taking sin away from you in all practical realities. And so we read in verse 20, Romans 6 and verse 20. For when ye were the servants of sin, ye were free from righteousness. What fruit had ye then in those things whereof you are now ashamed? For the end of those things is death. But now being made free from sin and become servants to God, ye have your fruit unto holiness and the end Everlasting life. So what do you need before you can have everlasting life? You need holiness. And the Bible says in Hebrews chapter 12 and verse 14, the Bible says, Follow peace with all men and holiness, without which no man shall see the Lord. So the bottom line is that we need to separate ourselves from sin. If we make a profession and if we say that we are Christians, Adventists, Seventh-day Adventists, whatever you want to call yourself, and there is not a separating of sin, then it is all a fraud. You're frauding yourself. 
we can get caught up playing church. If you're in the right church, if you hold the right truths, then you're saved. You can hold the truth in unrighteousness, my friends. And upon such a people who hold the truth, and I mean that's the truth, not a fake truth, that, that is the truth. We can hold the truth in unrighteousness upon such a person, the wrath of God will be manifested. The fire will burn them. Not because God didn't like them, but they've just got sin harbored in them. And so, the question is, how? How will we be ready to meet Him? How will we be ready to meet Him? Let us just read a text, and I want to read you this text of, in, Re- in Revelation chapter 1. And this is a description of Jesus. Revelation chapter 1, and starting in verse 14. Speaking of Jesus, and you will see that this description of Jesus is just like what the Father looks like in Daniel chapter 10. That's uh, 7, sorry. Daniel 7, verse 10. In verse 14, speaking of the, the Son of Man, in verse, you can read that in verse 13, who we're talking about, that the Son of Man. And then verse 14, his head and his hairs were like were white like wool, as white as snow, and his eyes were as a flame of fire and his feet like unto fine brass as if they were burned in a furnace and his voice as the sound of many waters and he had in his right hand seven stars and out of his mouth went a sharp two-edged sword and his countenance was as the sun as the sun shineth in his strength have you looked at the sun lately? Or you, if you think of something brighter than that, that's who we've got to meet. But not that far away. You bring that within our atmosphere, how are you going to go? So if, if, what I'm saying is if you, if you came up to the sun as, as close as our moon is or closer to, than our moon, how would you go? You wouldn't go. You'd be dead. And does our sun exceed the glory of Jesus? Not at all. His face is just brighter than the sun. And his eyes like flame of fire. His x-ray vision straight through you. He sees your problems. Don't fool him. He knows what you're going through. He understands. But give it to him. He sees. This is Jesus. Now the question that I have, how? How can we be ready to meet him when he comes? How? Do you know we can't be ready to meet him? We will, be, we will never, ever be ready to meet him without sin. Have I got your attention? When is Jesus coming? Do you know he can come now? This person who we're talking about. When you've got sins, but do you know he can come now? Do you know that? So if you're waiting to be ready to receive Jesus, don't wait any longer. You won't be ready. You're a sinner. You're a sinner. You've got sin. Can you take away your sin? Can you purify yourself so that Jesus then can come to you? No. You need to receive him now. And how are you going to receive him? As a flaming fire. And what is that going to do? It's going to burn away your sin. It's going to burn away your sin. Read with me in John 14. John chapter 14. Here, our God is a consuming fire. And we read in the Gospel of John, chapter 14, 
starting in verse 17. We need to receive him today. Today is the day of salvation. If you hear his voice today, harden not your heart. In fact, if you do a Bible search and search out his voice and the word fire, the Bible says that his voice burns like a fire. So if you hear his voice, don't harden your heart. Read with me in John 14 and verse 17. It says, Even the Spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive, because it seeth him not, neither knoweth him. But ye know him, for he dwelleth with you, and shall be where in you. I will not leave you comfortless. I will come to you. Who's coming? Jesus coming. Is Jesus coming to you now? Or later? When do you want him to come? Do you want, to, do you want him to come now? Or do you go, oh, I don't want him to come now. He'll make me uncomfortable. I'll deal with it in twinkling of an eye when Jesus comes. It's the same person. He'll just burn you up. That's all. Because now... God is giving us a drink of this cup, but it's mixed with mercy. His flame of fire burns what? Sin. And if any human being hangs on to sin, what will it burn? Him. But if, if through the gospel of Christ, he can burn away your sin, if you let go of it, then you'll be ready in a sinless state when he comes in the clouds of glory to the whole earth. For us to be ready just for his coming full stop, we can't be ready. I cannot remedy the defects of my own character. I can't do it. I've tried. I can't. But as Jesus comes to me, he is coming to me. And he wants to make his abode with me. In verse 23, John 14, verse 23. And Jesus answered and said unto him, if, if a man love me, he will keep my words. And my Father will love him, and we will come unto him and make our abode with him. Our God is a consuming fire. He plans to come to you as a consuming fire. Are you prepared for that? You don't need to be prepared in the way of, holiness in this aspect but if we want to see him with our in all physical reality we first must have him come to burn our sins he will come to us if we hold his words now it's very applicable that jesus gives counsel on how to be ready for his coming to the church of Laodicea. And so if we read in Revelation chapter 3, Revelation chapter 3, starting in verse 20, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come in to him and will sup with him and he with me. If you hear his voice, don't harden your heart. Have you ever heard a sermon where the Word of God showed something, a sin, that you really loved. What did you do? The Word of God, you're, you're doing something, you're living in a certain lifestyle, you're practicing certain things, and God's Word comes and reveals that what you're doing is wrong. How do you act? How do you respond to that? Oh, no, that's out of context. That was back then. That wasn't for me. That's... Oh, I'm not really like that. And we excuse, and we make every excuse under the sun. But if we will just say, hey, I'm wrong. And if we take that thing that we naturally dislike and allow it to come into us and hold his words and take hold of his words, it will start burning. And next week's sermon is going to enlarge on how this actually works, how sin is removed from the character. That's what we're going to look at, how it's done. 
so that we can be very intelligent on the process that we don't just hear it but can do it engage in the process so jesus is saying if you hear my voice and you'll open your heart i will come unto you i will the the person who shines brighter than the sun the holy spirit who who is um who's manifested as flames of fire in the disciples experience how is he going to come malachi chapter 3 who is going to who are you going to let come into your heart into your life into to govern your life malachi chapter 3 and here's the question who verse 2 malachi 3 verse 2 who may abide the day of his coming and who shall stand when he appeareth who's going to stand when he when he, he appears to the world For he is like a refiner's fire, like full of soap, and he shall sit as a refiner and a purifier of silver. And he shall purify the sons of Levi and purge them as gold and silver, that they may offer unto the Lord, unto the Lord an offering in righteousness. And holiness is the same description as righteousness. And so here, this is the person you're allowing into your, into your life. The refiner, the, fire, the person who burns with fire. Now, when John the Baptist was baptizing, he was baptizing with water unto repentance. But then he said a remarkable thing. He says that he that cometh after me is greater than I, and he shall baptize you with fire and with the Holy Ghost, and he shall thoroughly purge his floor. And he it describes the last day event. We get satisfied just to be baptized with water and think, yep, I've been baptized into the church. Our church holds the truth. And um, yeah, I mean, it's got defect, defective people in the church, but that's okay as long as we just hold the truth. But we miss out on the baptism of fire. Because fire isn't just about holding the truth in in. Uh, acknowledging the truth as truth but as allowing it to burn away your sins that you cease to live in sin that is the whole reason why jesus died and so jesus was talking about this baptism when the disciples came to him and says can we, can we sit on the right hand and on the left hand the, the mother of the disciples in john you can read that in matthew sorry matthew 20 you can read the story and Jesus says to them, are you able to drink the cup that I will drink of? Are you able to be baptized with the baptism that I am baptized with? And I said, yeah, we can do that. He says, well, <laughs> they didn't really understand what they were saying. But he says, you will be baptized with the baptism that I'm, bap that I'm baptized with and you will drink of that cup. The world has to drink the cup and we have to drink the cup. There's one difference and that is the cup that he offers first is mingled with mercy is mingled with mercy. And so how does God burn away our sin? How does Jesus come to us? Like a fire? Let's read a text in 1 Peter 4. 1 Peter, 1 Peter chapter 4 and verse 12. Christ is coming. If you open your heart, he will come. And how does he come? He comes as a consuming fire. Why? Because he is a consuming fire. And as he comes, the apostle says, Beloved, think it not strange concerning the fiery trial that is to try you, as, as though some strange thing happened to you. But rejoice, insomuch as ye are partakers of Christ's sufferings. So as, as the Lord comes to us in the, in, the, in, in, in the operation as fire, he comes as a trial. You notice when he said to the disciples, he says, the Holy Spirit, he is with you, but he shall be in you. You know, the disciples had been following Christ for three and a half years, and yet they had not received the inner working of God. 
So my question is today, how many people profess to follow the Lord or follow the Lord and have not had the fire burning away their sins? And so the disciples went through their trial. And that trial, when Christ suffered, the disciples suffered also, didn't they? And so the Bible is saying, don't think it strange. You know how you, tr- you know, when a stranger just turns up and starts communicating with you, you're like, hey, what are you doing? Well, the Bible's saying, when you have a fiery trial in your life, don't say, hey, what's happening to me? Don't think that because it's Jesus coming to you. What to do? Burn away your sin. He's, he's, he's not to be treated like a stranger. Because if he comes to us and we're awfully surprised and saying, who is this? I mean, I know Jesus. He's the person that, that makes life easy. But this problem, this can't be Jesus. This is the devil. And so the trials that we get, we blame the devil for when they're actually the orchestration of God to purge away your sins. And yes, the Lord may use the devil because the devil's just a puppet in the, in the Lord's hands. God can, God can just use his action to prove his will. And so my, my question is, if you treat the coming of Jesus into your life that is a fire experience through a fire trial and you think it's strange, then do you really know God? And if you don't know God, then what is the wrath of God coming upon? All them that know not God. So when you go through a very fiery trial in your life, treat it as a friend, not a stranger. Speaking about the consuming fire, Job Job 22 and verse 21 and the ver- verse before is talking about the consuming fire. And then verse 21, it says, Acquaint now thyself with him, and be at peace, whereby good shall come unto thee. Receive, I pray thee, the law from his mouth, and lay up his words in thy heart. Acquaint yourself with the Lord. So next time you have a problem, next time you have a fiery trial, say, hey, my old acquaintance, Come on in and, ex- and receive the trial with joy. Why can you do that? Because you are suffering the sufferings of Christ. Isn't God in control of your life? Do you believe that? Then do you think that he, he, he puts you through things that he think, whoop, that was a bit too hard, I just killed them. No, he turns the heat up enough not to kill us, but to kill our sins. That's his aim. I mean, the doctors do it to kill cancer with the radiation therapy and all the other therapies. They want to kill the cancer, but often they tweak it all too much and kill the patient as well. Well, God's not up for killing patients. He's up for killing cancer. He's up to kill the sin. But it requires a painful experience. Does anywhere in the Bible teach that our life here on earth is going to be rosy and sweet? doesn't teach that so don't think it strange concerning the fiery trial that is to try you as though some strange thing happened unto you but rejoice why rejoice in so much as you are partakers of the suffering of 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 christ's sufferings that when his glory shall be revealed you may be glad also with exceeding joy the trial you go through today is preparing you to meet him in physical reality. So are you ready for the coming of Jesus in your own life? Are you ready to go through fiery trials? Now, some men's sins are open beforehand, going into judgment according to According to 1 Timothy chapter 5 and verse 24, some men's sins are open beforehand going into judgment and other men's sins follow after. When do you want your sins purged from you? Now? Or on the great day of the appearing of our Lord? 
So let it, let it sink right into the fact that if you want to be prepared, if you hear God's voice, if you hear God's word and you think, you know, this is going to be a struggle in my life if I adopt this practice. If I become this, then everyone's going to give me slack. And if I follow the Lord here, it's going to be hard here. Then, and, and if we go ahead and do it and suffer the consequences of following truth, we'll be ready. If not, we will suffer later. Day and night, no rest. So the principle is pain now, pleasure later. Or if you want to have pleasure now, God can give you a lie that you, you, think, you, have, you think you're saved and he can give you a little bit of peace, but you'll have pain later. Which do you want? Pain now, pleasure later. Or pleasure now, pain later. And whatever is last, is lasting. So if you want to finish off, if the last thing you want to experience is pleasure, then that last pleasure will be lasting pleasure. But if you want to finish off with pain, then your pain, which is last, will be lasting. So there was a prayer the psalmist said, Search me, O God. And know my thoughts and try me. Why? To see if there be any wicked way in me. And lead me into the path everlasting. There is a path that has been mapped out through the gospel that every soul can be saved. That when Christ comes, no one has any excuse to die. He doesn't take pleasure in the death of the wicked. But if we, have, if we haven't adopted his words and followed his words at the cost of everything on earth and allowed the fire to burn away those sins and habits of ours, we will not be prepared to meet him. And so I want to conclude with a scripture in, Psalms uh, sorry, in, in Isaiah chapter 6. Isaiah chapter 6 and starting in verse 1 and in the year that King Uzzah died I saw also the Lord sitting upon a throne high and lifted up and his train filled the temple above it stood the seraphims or the burning ones one had six we one uh, each one had six wings. With twain he covered his face, and with twain he covered his feet, and with twain he did fly. And one cried unto the, uh, to, to another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is, filled, is full of his glory. And the posts of the door moved at the voice of him that cried, and the house was filled with smoke. Now, what was the response as a sinner seeing that in a vision? Then said I, woe is me, for I am undone, because I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. For my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. Then flew one of the seraphims unto me, having a live coal in his hand, which he had taken with the tongs from off the altar, and he laid it upon my mouth and said, Lo, this has touched thy lips, and thy iniquity is taken away, and thy sin purged. If you get a good glimpse of the character of God displayed in Jesus Christ, you will exclaim, Wow, I am so sinful. And if you see your sins and you think, how could I ever be ready when Jesus comes in appearance in the clouds? How could I ever be ready? The only way you can be ready is if you're ready to have him now. And how do you become ready? See your sins. That's it. If you're a sinner and you see things that mar your life and, and in, in my life, and I think, you know, I can... These things I hate, I see Jesus, I love him. And in my character are these certain things. But you know what I believe? 
I believe the Lord will orchestrate my life to plunge me into experiences to burn them away. That I won't have them anymore. He will touch me with the fire from heaven. And I'll be baptized with the fire. And when God sees fit that that's done, he will do it. The disciples weren't ready straight away for the baptism of fire. They were prepared for it. God in his love made them know him enough to carry through. And so acquaint yourself with the Lord. Because if you're acquainted with him, then when the fiery trial comes, you won't think it a stranger. You won't think it's strange at all. You'll know him. It's Jesus. Like, John, like, like, um, like Jacob when he wrestled with the angel. Well, it was sort of a little bit of a surprise to him. Ooh, a stranger's coming to wrestle with me. Oh, it was a blessed Lord. And he hung on. I'm not going to let you go until you bless me. And when we get the tri fiery trials in our life, we'll hang on and say, Lord, I do not want this trial to go away until I am fully blessed and my sins are gone. And then we can be happy when Jesus comes. We can rejoice at his appearing, then and then only. And so the third angel's message answers the first question that I mentioned in the sermon. Who will live with everlasting fire? Those who receive the mark of the beast in his image will be tormented. But here is the patience of the saints. Here are they that keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. Who will live in eternal burning fire? Isaiah 33 verse 14 and 15. Let's, clue, let's read this text again. Because Satan has tricked the world to think that sinners will live forever in the fire. But not so. They will be as though they were not, according to Holy Scripture. And so in Isaiah 33, the question is, the sinners in Zion are afraid. You know, Zion is the church. When Jesus comes, church members will be dead scared. Will you be one of them? Will I be one of them? Fearfulness has surprised the hypocrites. Who among us? shall dwell with the devouring fire. Who among us shall dwell with the everlasting burnings? He that walketh righteously and speaketh uprightly. He that despises the gain of oppressions, that shakes his hand from holding of bribes and stops his ears from hearing of blood and shuts his eyes from seeing evil. It is my prayer that we can become acquainted with God and have peace in all our trials, for we know what the end will be. Amen.